Who was W.E.B. Du Bois's only surviving daughter? And what can we learn from her life and death? We'll discuss that today on Footnoting History. Hello, and welcome to Footnoting History. This is Elizabeth, and I will be your host this week. It might not surprise you to learn that this episode topic was inspired by an article I read about placing a headstone on Nina Yolanda Du Bois's grave five decades after her death. My love of cemeteries, tapophilia, is well documented in past episodes. I decided to further delve into Yolanda's life, though, because I was intrigued by the life of W.E.B. Du Bois's only surviving child her connection to the Harlem Renaissance, and her own legacy to the history of the United States of America. What struck me while researching Yolanda was how often she is a cursory figure. To learn about her, you do not research her, but her famous father. She is hard to get a handle on as we see little in the record of her actions, her beliefs, but rather she seems at times like a reflection for others. Much of what we know of Yolanda is through her father and the public's eyes. We have letters W.E.B. wrote Yolanda, and we have letters she or her mother wrote back to her father. And later on, we have newspaper articles about her marriage and subsequent divorce. I want then to try and put Yolanda on center stage. And yet, to do that, I need to explain the world she was born into and how it was shaped by both her father and others. Yolanda was born in 1900 in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Her parents, W.E.B. and Nina, were an African-American couple. Her father, W.E.B. Du Bois, is one of the best known and most vocal supporters of racial equality from the early 20th century. Incredibly well-educated even by today's standards, he had a PhD from Harvard, W.E.B. embraced and promoted the idea of the talented 10th, that one out of every 10 black men was capable of leadership. They just needed the right education and a support to help them achieve it. W.E.B.'s views were controversial. The white community much more preferred that of Booker T. Washington, who believed that if black people worked hard enough, eventually they would gain acceptance into white society. Instead, Yolanda's father argued that black Americans would have to fight for equality. It would never be given. Yolanda's father and mother had married in 1896, four years before her birth. She was not their first child. A year after their marriage, W.E.B. and Nina welcomed a son, Berghardt. Even though W.E.B. was working for the University of Pennsylvania during Nina's pregnancy, he sent her back to Great Barrington for the birth. In Philadelphia, they were living in an impoverished African-American neighborhood, the same neighborhood W.E.B. was actually compiling a case study of, and he did not feel it was an area conducive to a healthy pregnancy or a successful birth. Burghardt Du Bois was born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts in October 1897. His father was not there. He had stayed working in Philadelphia. According to reports, though, on hearing the news of his son's birth, W.E.B. was overjoyed. But he wanted to finish up some work and so did not travel to Massachusetts until Burghardt was a few weeks old. Later, he describes seeing his son as follows, quote, I saw the strength of my own arm stretched onward through the ages of the newer strength of his. Saw the dream of my black father stagger a step onward in the wild phantasm of the world heard in his baby voice the voice of the prophet that was to rise within the veil, end quote. One sees the high expectations W.E.B. had for his children, and Yolanda would not escape them either. The year after Burghardt's birth, W.E.B.'s work at the University of Pennsylvania was complete. The family moved to Atlanta, as W.E.B. had been appointed to a professorship there. Nina had never lived in the South before, and Atlanta in 1898 was very different from an African-American woman than life she had led in Massachusetts or Pennsylvania or in the Midwest where she was from. Even though W.E.B.'s position as a university professor could have elevated his status, the family's skin color kept them firmly entrenched as second-class citizens. It was only three years, after all, since Booker T. Washington had given his speech the Atlanta Compromise, in which he had stated that the black community would cede political power to the white community in exchange for education and due process. Unfortunately, W.E.B. and Nina found in a devastating way how racism impacted their lives far beyond the daily indignities of not being able to use various parks nor ride in certain sections of public transit. Around 18 months, baby Berghardt became ill. He languished for 10 days. 
WEB was unable to get one of the city's African-American doctors who had overwhelming caseloads, as there were so few of them, to see the child, and none of the white doctors who live locally would care for the child. Burghardt, the child in whom WEB had heard, quote, in his baby voice, the voice of the prophet that was to rise within the veil, end quote, passed away, most likely of diphtheria. Diphtheria causes a thick gray membrane to cover the throat and tonsils, and some who have described it like watching a person drown outside of water. The sickness and death of Burghardt forever changed his parents. The distraught parents brought their baby back to Great Barrington and buried him. Eighteen months after the death of Burghardt, Nina gave birth to their second and only surviving child, Nina Yolanda Du Bois, who went by the name Yolanda. Like Burghardt and her father, Yolanda was born in Great Barrington, but shortly after Nina returned to Atlanta with their new baby. Her father continued his professorship in Atlanta, and he and Nina raised Yolanda there. Nina, having lost one child to the disease, became overly concerned with cleanliness and also suffered greatly, raising a second baby in the city in which her oldest had died. For a number of years, though, the family lived there until, again, the racism of Atlanta led W.E.B. to seek refuge for his family in Great Barrington. For those who listened to my episode on Washington Park Cemetery, you are aware that in the early 20th century, Atlanta was legally segregated on racial lines, but that some members of the African-American community in Atlanta were able to achieve levels of prosperity. This prosperity did not go unnoticed by the white community, and since the 1890s, anger over perceived uppityness or too much wealth by African-Americans in Atlanta were a source of consternation. In 1906, these racial tensions were further inflamed by the rhetoric of the Georgia gubernatorial race until September 22, 1906. The Atlanta papers, both of which listeners of my earlier podcast will recognize, such as the Constitution and the Journal, reported that four white women had allegedly been assaulted by black men. For those who have studied race relations in the U.S., this trope of black males sexually violating a white woman was a common fear and eventually accusation. In the 1950s, for example, 12-year-old Emmett Till was murdered for allegedly whistling at a white woman. Like the accusation against Till, the accounts of assaults by black men on white women in the Atlanta papers on September 22, 1906 were unsubstantiated and not true. The impact of them, however, was horrifying. The resulting white mob became so destructive as it brought death and destruction to the black business district that the state militia was called in. As a result of the Atlanta race riots, Yolanda and her mother Nina were sent back to Great Barrington. While there, Yolanda attended the same elementary school as her father. From there, though, we do not hear of Yolanda for about eight years. The next time we learn of her is in a letter W.E.B. wrote to Yolanda in 1914. At age 14, Yolanda was sent to England to study at an elite and incredibly expensive boarding school. Most likely, Yolanda's term started around Michaelmas, traditionally the end of September, but W.E.B. does not write to her until the end of October, a deliberate decision as he wanted his daughter to be settled and somewhat used to her environment before contacting her. In an age of near-instant text message exchanges across the globe, this decision to wait weeks, knowing that your child would not receive it for yet another few more weeks, is an interesting moment for all of us to behold. But W.E.B. had studied abroad in Germany, and it has been argued that it was this time that led W.E.B. to fully embrace the understanding of race and determinism that he would bring back to America as a young man. Seemingly, he felt that Yolanda would feel the same, and he began by writing that though she would understandably miss America, eventually she would develop a fondness for the old world. He tells her not to worry if people laugh at her brown skin or sweet, crinkly hair. These annoyances will happen, but what is most important is that she must not laugh at herself. This advice from a father who most likely had been there and done that. Did he truly forget those that laughed at his appearance as he told Yolanda she would? But we also hear in the letter statements which show how W.E.B. viewed his child. She was not to think she was in England because of her intelligence or that she had earned her seat, but through luck. He tells her then to deserve it, to work for it. He, quote, expects her to be a wonderful woman, end quote. W.E.B. knows how hard it will be for his daughter to physically stand out from her peers, but he does not want any of that to stop her. In closing, he requests a weekly letter from her. But Yolanda does not hear from her father very frequently. Her letters to him have been described by various authors as cries for attention as the young girl, according to her reports, 
constantly suffered from various illnesses, chronic but not fatal. Her mother, having already lost one child, feared a similar fate and watched Yolanda closely. Their medical bills rivaled that of their housing expenses. Yolanda did not do well academically at the boarding school. In fact, her father decided to take her out for her final year. Yolanda did fight this and even had her friends create a letter writing campaign, but it was all to no avail. Yolanda returned to the U.S. Next, though, she was enrolled at Fisk University, her father's alma mater, a private historically black university in Nashville, Tennessee, which had been founded in 1866. The school was largely focused on teacher training, and by the time Yolanda enrolled in it, it was the premier black college in the U.S. While in college, Yolanda continued to suffer from various illnesses which required visits from her mother and long letters to her father. Her grades also were not stellar, but what perhaps upset her father the most was a young man she began dating while there, Jimmy Lunsford. In recent years, there has been a discussion of colorism, where members of the African-American community or other communities of color seem to prefer those who have lighter skin tones to darker ones. W.E.B. and Nina were relatively light-skinned. Yolanda was as well. Jimmy Lunsford was dark, younger than Yolanda, and studying to be a jazz musician. W.E.B. shut down the romance, leading to more health problems on Yolanda's end, but W.E.B. did not believe that Jimmy represented the talented tenth, and he was focused on his child marrying a man who would continue to demonstrate the abilities of African Americans. Yolanda graduated from Fisk and moved to New York. During this time, she joined the Delta Sigma Theta sorority, a sorority devoted to political causes, especially of African American women. Her dues were paid by her father, and it's possible that it was more of an interest of W.E.B. than Yolanda. Another interest of W.E.B., as seen above by who he did not like when she dated, was to whom his daughter would marry, and he and his associates introduced Yolanda to a young man, well-respected in the upcoming literature scene based in Harlem. This period of the 1920s, known as the Harlem Renaissance, supported W.E.B.'s belief in the Talented Tenth to an exceptional degree, including such luminaries as Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston. Among them was a young poet, son of a pastor, County Cullen. Yolanda's friends suggested she read poetry like that of Edna St. Vincent Millay to be able to converse with her beau. Reportedly, Yolanda said of the poem she, quote, liked all of them, end quote, and that she liked to hear County talk. An auspicious beginning, to be sure. In County, W.E.B. may have seen the realization of all the baby Burghardt might have been had he lived. Yolanda wanted a large and impressive wedding, and it was, although her father and fiancé spent a lot of time planning it without her and trying to rein in the young woman's demands. But married they were. On April 9, 1928, Yolanda and County were married in Harlem, and it was the social event of the African-American community. Unfortunately for Yolanda and County, the marriage did not work out. The gossip, which was known before the wedding, was that County was gay. There are arguments on whether W.E.B. knew and if he hoped that County would at least still father more children for the Talented Tenth, but it did not work out. I'm going to take a step back here because what we have from this period are letters W.E.B. wrote to County on Yolanda and then back to him. To County, he offered sympathy and did suggest that the young husband make sure that his bride was fully comfortable with all of their marital relationship and the county knew that he did not own Yolanda's body and that she might be naive. To Yolanda, however, his tone is more negative. He seems to lay a lot of blame for the failing marriage on Yolanda's selfishness, as he stated. When the divorce was finalized, W.E.B. told County that he would always be there to offer artistic support. Yolanda, post-divorce, moved to Maryland to teach high school. There, she met an attractive night student who had dropped out of college, Arnett Williams. W.E.B. and Nina did not really support the relationship, but they also decided not to fight their daughter. W.E.B.'s only requirement was that Arnett finish college, but W.E.B. would pay the tuition. The two were wed in September 1931, and their baby, Du Bois Williams, called baby, was born a year later. The parents lived separately for a great deal of time as Arnett finished school and Yolanda went for her master's at Teachers College at Columbia University. Nina largely raised baby Du Bois. 
Yolanda returned to Maryland for work, leaving her mother Nina and baby in New York. Eventually, Arnett joined her in Maryland, but their relationship, especially as Arnett's drinking became apparent, also became physically violent. This time, at least, W.E.B. mostly took his daughter's side, but he also told Arnett that as long as the divorce was uncontested, he would pay off the rest of the young man's educational debt. Arnett agreed, and the divorce was finalized in 1936. For the next few years, Nina and W.E.B. continued to raise baby Du Bois, including in Atlanta, while Yolanda worked, her chronic health complaints continuing. According to Baby, around age nine, her mother took her to a jazz show where Jimmy Lunsford, Yolanda's college sweetheart, performed. Yolanda took Baby to meet him, and the musician began to cry seeing this little girl that he felt could have been his. Jimmy never married, and a few years later, he passed away at age 45 from a coronary occlusion while traveling with his orchestra in Oregon. Although there was some speculation that the band was poisoned by a restaurant owner who did not want to serve African Americans. All of them became ill within a few hours of eating, but only Jimmy died. For the remainder of her life, Yolanda lived relatively quietly. Her mother, Nina, died in 1950, and her father shortly thereafter remarried. She and Baby were present at celebrations for her father, and Baby grew up married and had a son of her own, Arthur. Yolanda continued to teach high school in Baltimore, Maryland, and in March 1961, Yolanda passed away from a coronary attack. Her father, who was traveling in Nigeria as part of his plan for pan-Africanism, was devastated. Yolanda was buried next to Nina and Berghardt, her mother and her brother, in the cemetery in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. But her devastated father left the country and Yolanda's grave went unmarked until, as mentioned at the opening of this episode, the Du Bois Society of Great Barrington, Massachusetts organized this event. In 2012, Yolanda was given a headstone. Even in death, though, her father, who was 93 when he buried his daughter, stated that he chose Great Barrington because she would lie by Berghart, the infant brother she had never met, but whose life and death had so shaped her life. Most of what we know about Yolanda is sparse. A lot is based on the letters her father wrote to her, which means, again, that Yolanda's voice is hard to draw out from the sources. We have health complaints from her, letters from her mother describing the illnesses of their child, we have been given a picture in biographies of a spoiled child demanding her father's attention. What we also see, however, is a typical young woman who perhaps did not want to be the spokesperson for the talented 10th, who wanted to be allowed to marry as she wished to a man who loved her, who did well enough at school and enjoyed teaching, but did not see herself nor desire to be a guiding light of the nascent civil rights movement of the early 20th century. Because of the death of her brother, though, this mantle was placed upon her shoulders. In any other family in early 20th century America, a young woman who completed college and graduate school and taught high school for decades would have been a success story. In an African-American family where educational opportunities were even more constricted than for other women, even more so. One could argue that doors opened for Yolanda because of her famous father, but even though her academic record was not stellar, it was not abysmal. There is no evidence that Yolanda was passed through programs because of her father. And yet, in the Du Bois family, Yolanda's accomplishments did not even achieve what was expected, let alone what was demanded. It was not easy to be the daughter of W.E.B. Du Bois. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes.